Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for the introduction and uh, thank you for the invitation to speak in the seminar. It's, I'm, you know, as much as, as we're restricted in our movements right now because of COVID, it's, it's really nice that we can now have these, you know, global reaching seminars. So you know, I really appreciate you guys putting this on. Um, right. So I'm uh, going to talk about some recent joint work with Wilhelm Winter. Uh, and this is, it's, it's part of a, a slightly larger project, but it has a lot of interest in its own right. Uh, and so this is the focus that I want to have is on images of CPC order zero maps, and in particular, C star structures that one can witness on them. Um, so I want to start off with a motivating example of a very special CPC order zero map. All right. So a fundamental theorem of uh, Choi and Efros and independently of Kirchberg tells us that any separable unital nuclear, well, actually any nuclear C star algebra satisfies what's known as the completely positive approximation property. Um, in the case where it's separa separable, we can phrase it as follows. There exists a family, even a sequence of finite dimensional C star algebras and completely positive and also contractive maps uh, that go from your C star algebra A into the finite dimensional C star algebras and back into A, such that their composition uh, converges pointwise in norm to the identity map on A. So when I say completely positive and contractive, this simply means, so A uh, as a C star algebra has a lot of positive elements in it. Um, these maps will map positive elements in A into positive elements in Fn. And moreover, when I take matrix amplifications of A and Fn, that stays true. Uh, the contractive uh, simply means that these are norm decreasing. So visually, many times when, when one introduces such a property, we show it in terms of these approximately commuting zigzag diagrams, which I actually really prefer for slideshows because they're fun to manipulate. So in a sense, because this completely positive approximation approximates the identity map in A, uh, all of the information you could want about A as far as its structure or K-theory or even traces is contained in this approximating system. When I say contained in this approximating system, I mean in a sense you can sort of just ignore the A bits of it take the compositions of the maps, and now you've got completely positive maps between these finite dimensional C star algebras. And somewhere within that sequence, you can find all of the information that you would need about A. But the question, of course, is how do you read off the structural properties from A from just these finite dimensional C star algebras and the induced maps between them? And uh, one potential way to do this is to sort of consider what happens at the end. So on the top sequence, uh, on the top sequence, it's clear what happens at the end. Uh, we just get the C star algebra A back. Now on the bottom, because of the, these nice boundedness restrictions that are put on these maps, we're going to be able to define uh, some sort of limiting structure for what's happening downstairs as well. And moreover, because we have this intertwining, I'm going to want to have, or I'm going to end up with some sort of nice bijective correspondence between my C star algebra A and this limiting structure downstairs as well. So the first question is, what is this limiting structure downstairs? What is this X? So fortunately, there's already really a nice framework for how we want to define the X. We just simply modify the constructions from Black and Iron Kirchberg to form it as an inductive limit from the uh, what I'll call the generalized inductive system, which is these maps F, uh, these Fn's, and these induced maps between them that I got from just composing the maps that came from the completely positive approximation of A. Uh, so now I've got a sequence of finite dimensional C star algebras and completely positive contractions between them. Now, if I take all of these C star algebras and take their direct product, um, then the, uh, the quotient of this by the null sequences, I'm going to denote by this uh, F sub infinity, or I'll call it the sequence algebra for lack of a better term. Uh, now using that, 
I can define maps, CPC maps, in fact, from each of the finite dimensional C star algebras, FK, into the sequence algebra. So this is just like how we construct an inductive limit for, uh, for C star algebras where these fians would have been star homomorphisms, but now they're not. Now they're just CPC maps. Um, so they're mapping from FK into the sequence algebra um, by just uh, basically just taking all of the images of X under everything after K uh, and then looking at that image in the quotient. Naturally, it doesn't really matter what happens before K. Uh, right, and so when we take, so we take the images of all of these FKs, uh, take the union of them and close it off, again, just like we would when defining an inductive limit of C star algebras um, in the more classical sense with star homomorphisms. Um, and we call this guy our generalized inductive limit. Ooh, I'll put it on the bottom there, squeeze it in though. Uh, caution. Um, so I said we modified Blackadar and Kirchberg's construction. There is a crucial difference. Uh, there are a lot of slight differences, but in the end there's one crucial difference, and that is in their construction, they assume that their maps are um, asymptotically multiplicative. And what that does is it guarantees that their inductive limit's actually going to be a C star algebra. We have not imposed that, and so our limit will not necessarily be a C star algebra. That's fine. It's going to end up basically being a C star algebra when we're done with it anyway. Okay, so now we know what X is going to be. Uh, it's defined as this generalized inductive limit. This is the same uh, completely positive approximation we saw before, but now I've written this union as this uh, row instead. So now let's get to this correspondence between A and X. So there's a natural way that I want to define this correspondence, right? You just want to sort of get it out of all of these downwards maps and sort of just take the limit of it in the end. More formally, uh, we want to define a map psi from A to F infinity um, by just looking at for each image, uh, for each element A and A, you look at all of its images under all the downwards maps and then take that uh, bounded sequence uh, and then just look at its uh, image in the sequence algebra, F infinity. So naturally we want psi of A to be equal to X. We actually want to have a nice one-to-one -one correspondence, but first of all, I want the image of uh, A under this map psi to be X. And unfortunately that's not so automatic. We need to put some additional restrictions on our, um, on our completely positive approximation. So we arrange for this by assuming that the maps from our completely positive approximation satisfy a certain summability criteria. I won't say what it is because it will just be distractingly technical. Um, suffice to say that after passing to a sub approximation, you can always arrange this for a, for a uh, nuclear C star algebra. And to give a feeling for what it says, uh, what it's telling us is that if we look at these maps, these um, maps that give us these, uh, that come from this generalized inductive sequence, so the zigzags, so in other words, the row in K, which is where at the kth stage I go up into A and then back down and then up and then all the way down to um, Fn, this is going to get close to the map where at the kth stage I would have gone up into A and then just hang out in A for a while and then go back down. Uh, and so if I sort of make these maps hug close together, then that's gonna smooth over some issues and psi of A is gonna be equal to X, just like we would want it to. Okay, um, so proposition, let's take the CPC approximation of A uh, from before and assume moreover that these satisfy the summability criteria then the map psi from A to F infinity that we defined before is actually, it's an injective CPC map with closed image where psi, of, um, where the image is actually this generalized inductive limit of these FKs. Um, so this proposition modulo the summability criteria, the fact that psi is an injective CPC map with closed image, I, I'm sure that this is knowable to the experts, um, if not known. But either way, one nice upshot that you get from your functional analysis class 
is that Psi is an injective uh, map between Fanuc spaces um, with a closed image. So that means it's invertible. Um, but we want X to preserve a lot of the structure of A, where A is a C star algebra. So invertible map between Banach spaces is not really enough for us. We want a stronger correspondence between A and X. So now if A were, uh, so if Psi were unital, then this inverse would actually end up being UCP. One can argue that the inverse would actually end up being UCP. And then Psi would be what we would call a complete order isomorphism. So it would have a direct correspondence between positive elements in A and positive elements in X. And this would be a very nice, robust correspondence between X and A. However, we very often want to place demands on our CP approximation of A that will make it impossible for Psi to be unital. Uh, in particular, certain uh, orthogonality preserving uh, demands. Also, I should say, because I meant to, to remark this earlier, I've simplified the setting just a little bit uh, when I assumed that we're working in a completely positive contractive approximation of a, of a nuclear C star algebra. Um, the maps need not necessarily all be contractive per se, uh, in which case um, obtaining a complete order isomorphism for psi becomes even harder. Um, but I've omitted that for the sake of this talk, just to sort of streamline. Okay, so nonetheless, even though psi, we're not going to assume that it's unital, we can still arrange that it's inverse, uh, along with the matrix amplification, still sends positive elements to positive elements. Um, in other words, we have this direct correspondence that if it was positive in A, um, then it's positive in uh, F infinity and vice versa. But in order to do this, we're going to need a little bit more structure on the map psi. So by structure, I mean an orthogonality preserving condition. So um, I attribute this definition to Vincent Zacharias because it's actually more of a theorem or a corollary as opposed to a definition but we're going to go with it for the sake of this talk. Um, so let B and C be C star algebras with C unital. A CP map is order zero in this setting. If uh, the product, or if um, it's multiplicative, modulo playing, uh, paying a penalty of multiplication by unit. Okay, so it turns out that if you have an injective CP order zero map between C star algebras, then you actually get to say that if you have uh, an element that's positive in the image, then it's actually lifts to a positive element in the pre-image. Uh, so again, if we were dealing with a star homomorphism, this sort of thing would be automatic, um, positives lifts to positives. In a CP setting, that's not necessarily true, but it turns out that it is true in the setting where you have an injective CP order zero map. Uh, and also this passes to matrix amplifications. Okay, uh, so what does that do for us in our setting? So any separable unital nuclear C star algebra. Uh, so this, um, sorry, this theorem, Okay, it's really kind of hard to say exactly where to attribute this theorem because it was knowable from work of Blackadar and Kerchberg via the lens of work of Venter and Zacharias. But if you want to see it formally written down somewhere, I would point you to Brown, Carrion, and White. Um, and yeah, so it says that any separable unital nuclear C star algebra admits a CPC approximation um, with the maps psi n being what we call approximately order zero. Uh, and without really parsing what that definition comes to, what it amounts to is that this, this limiting map that I got from A into uh, the sequence algebra F infinity is actually going to be order zero, CPC order zero. Uh, and moreover, we can arrange that um, the maps psi n, this is running off the screen, but basically we can arrange that the map psi n also satisfy the summability criteria that we had before. Okay. 
So this is what the proposition comes to now. So let's take a CPC approximation as before. Uh, assume moreover that this approximation satisfies the summability criteria. And now we're actually assuming that the maps, the downwards maps are approximately order zero. Then similarly to what we had before, the map psi from A to F infinity, uh, which is given by psi of A is, um, you just look at the images under all the downwards maps and then take the quotient map. Um, into the sequence algebra. So this is injective CPC order zero. It has closed image. Its closed image is the generalized inductive limit of these uh, FKs. And moreover, we get this nice behavior of the positive elements, right? So, um, so uh, an element is positive uh, inside of X if and only if it was positive inside of A and that holds uh, up to matrix amplifications. So now, I'm irritated that I'm going off screen, but I think this is the longest slide I've got. So I'll just say what, it, what are, what's kind of falling off the screen. Uh, yeah, so in fact, I can still call the M versus CP map um, and I can still call Psi a complete order isomorphism, but if I want to be very pedantic, um, X, is not going to be an operator subsystem of F infinity. It, it satisfies all the criteria as closed self adjoint subspace, but it probably does not contain the unit. I already sort of excluded that option before. So if it's not an operator subsystem, then I need to make a little bit more sense of what I want to, how I want to say that this is completely positive. So the following slide is just sort of for the sake of being pedantic and also to sort of say how I match up with um, some of the surrounding literature. So, so even though um, Psi of A is not an operator subsystem of F infinity by virtue of not necessarily containing the unit, um, the triple, which consists of X and then for each R, you look at uh, the matrix amplifications of X intersected with just the positive elements that are coming from F infinity. So these are all the positive elements um, of F infinity that happen to fall into X. Uh, and then this, uh, the image of the unit of A, this still forms what's called an abstract operator system. So I don't wanna go into too much detail on this, um, mostly just to, this is mostly just to, to assure the people who are familiar with this that I'm not really abusing the language. Um, so it consists of a star vector space, a matrix order. So you should think of this as the positive cone sort of structure you would, you would get from a C star algebra uh, and an Archimedean matrix order unit. Order units I'm gonna visit a little bit more shortly. Um, so one quick remark, and I'm going to really drive this home throughout the talk, is X is a normed vector space. So it's a little bit more than what we normally get when you define an uh, a, uh, abstract operator space or an abstract operator system. But its norm is not the norm that you would get um, that's induced by this matrix order. So it's sort of on one hand, it's a uh, abstract operator space or ab abstract operator system. And on the other hand, it is a self-adjoint uh, norm subspace of a C star algebra. Um, but if you confuse these two things or try to make them both hold simultaneously, you end up kind of trivializing some of the stuff we're trying to do. Okay. But the upshot is that um, when Psi is the CPC order zero map um, that I had before, then I'm not lying when I say that um, it has a CPC inverse. It's CPC inverse coming from this abstract operator system. And uh, also Psi is a complete order isomorphism. So I'm not lying when I'm using this terminology. Okay. So back away from the abstract operator systems and back to the um, picture that we started with. So we have separable unital nuclear C star algebra and we have a nice uh, CP approximation. And it is such that the map that is induced coming from these downwards maps uh, 
gives us a, uh, into the sequence algebra, uh, gives us a CPC order zero map, uh, which is moreover a complete order isomorphism between A and the generalized inductive limit of these uh, FKs uh, sitting inside of the sequence algebra. So the upshot is that we originally considered X because we wanted to use it to look for structural information about A. Uh, we were originally considering X as an inductive limit of these finite dimensional C star algebras and this uh, generalized inductive system that's coming from our completely positive approximation of A. But instead, let's just think of it for a moment, instead of as a generalized inductive limit, it's just the image of a nice CPC order zero map. And that's what I'm going to, that's how I'm going to lead into the next bit on the structure of the images of CPC order zero maps. And so this is how I want to think about uh, this generalized inductive limit for now. It's just the image of a nice CPC order zero map. So let C and B be C star algebras with C unital and theta from C to B be a CPC order zero map. Uh, so I'm going to suggestively write X for um, the image of C under this map and E for the image of the unit. And we get a couple of things um, automatically or via deep theorems. So the first one is, of course, E is going to be a positive contraction. It doesn't matter if B has a unit. I still write this to, to say that E is a positive contraction. So bear with me. Um, so by results of Wolf, we know that E actually uh, commutes with everything inside of X. Uh, so this statement is actually sort of recapsuling this theorem of Venter and Zacharias that I used to characterize um, order zero maps. And this is just saying that if I just look at the collections of products x, y for x, y, and x, um, so x squared is actually equivalent to the set of just e times all the elements in x. And finally, E is what I want to call a matrix order unit for X inside of B. And so now this fourth bit, I need to spend a little more time uh, defining. So given a self-adjoined subspace of a C star algebra, we say a positive element E and X is an order unit. Uh, if for each self-adjoined element, there's a positive number R so that if I scale up the order unit by R, it's gonna be, it's gonna dominate uh, the self-adjoined element. And it's a matrix order unit if this holds under matrix amplifications. Uh, this is definitely a vocabulary word that I am stealing from uh, the non-operator uh, or the non-algebraic crowd. Uh, so I want to justify it real quick. If um, E inside of the self-adjoint uh, subspace X is in fact going to be a, a matrix order unit as, as defined above, um, then it will actually um, be, it takes a little, a short proof to show this, but it will actually be an Archimedean order unit for the, for the matrix order. In other words, this does actually form an abstract operator system in the usual sense. And the upshot of this remark is I'm not abusing this language when I say that it's an order unit. Um, so, but basically we're just going to take uh, the definition of the order unit as X as a subspace of a C star algebra is given here. Okay, so that remark aside, um, a natural example of this is if you just have an operator subsystem, that means it's gonna be a unital self-adjoint subspace, then the uh, unit is actually going to be a matrix order unit, which is not such a big surprise. Um, a, very small but less trivial example is, in fact, if you just take any positive element and you just look at its span, this positive element is going to be a um, matrix order unit for its span, so the self-adjoint subspace, which is the span of this uh, element. And a less uh, trivial class 
comes from the following. If you have a CP map from a unital C star algebra, then the image of the unit will actually be a matrix order unit for the self-adjoint subspace that's the image of the C star algebra. Uh, and the way that you see this is if you take a self-adjoint element, um, then it's going to have a self-adjoint pre-image. You can just take the real part of any pre-image to do this. Uh, and then, so X is going to be, um, so because C, for the same reason that uh, the unit is a matrix order unit, C is going to be dominated by norm of C times the unit. Uh, and that gets carried through with the CP map. So this gives us a larger class and less trivial class of these order units. Okay, so now back to the, the statement we had before. Uh, so if I've got a CPC order zero map, then I get these, these nice four things. And it turns out that from these four things, I'm going to be able to define a pre C star structure on my self adjoint subspace X. Uh, so let's write that in theorem form. So let B be a C star algebra, X a self adjoint subspace, and E a distinguished element that satisfies these four criteria I mentioned before. E is positive, commutes with X. Um, the sets X squared and EX coincide, and E is a matrix order unit for X. Then there is an associative bilinear map that I can define on X. Uh, it moreover satisfies this, this um, nice little relation here. This will start to come into play more and more as we carry on, but primarily they're just an associative bilinear map that makes X with this multiplication a star algebra. Um, and moreover, we can define a pre C star norm, uh, which I'll call a uh, bullet norm on X with this associative bilinear map. What that means is that when I take X with this associative um, bilinear map and I close it off with this pre C star norm, I get a C star algebra. Okay. So let's see where this guy is going to come from. All right. So for the associative bilinear map, let's first assume that we're working with a particularly nice case where X actually is the image of a CPC order zero map. Then how am I going to define this multiplication? I'm basically going to push forward the multiplication from A. So it turns out that if I define um, this bullet multiplication by theta of A um, bullet theta of B is theta of multiplication inside of my original C star algebra. Um, this is going to define an associative bilinear map, um, which actually moreover by virtue of theta being a order zero map is gonna satisfy um, this equation that I mentioned before. Okay. So the problem is that if I don't have an order zero map waiting in the wings, I'm not actually going to be able to tell you what X bullet Y is, but I can tell you that it exists. And this is why. So this is, um, this is a lemma that I actually sort of just almost wanted to find an excuse to put this lemma in because I think it showcases how nice, um, an order unit is for a self-adjoint subspace. Oh, ignore closed. That's a typo. Closed is nice, but I don't need it. Um, right, so let's say that I've got a self-adjoint subspace of a C star algebra, and I have this distinguished positive element that commutes with it and is an order unit. So I've dropped one of my four conditions. Um, this is just a commuting positive order unit. Then it turns out uh, it satisfies this nice cancellative property. So um, if for any positive uh, integer n, e to the n times x is equal to e to the n times y, then that means x is equal to y. Uh, and moreover, I also get similar statements for self-adjointness and positivity. x is self-adjoint if and only if uh, e times x is self-adjoint. x is positive if and only if e times x is positive. 
And this is all really just coming from playing around with functional calculus and using the power of, of an order unit uh, within the functional calculus. Okay, so taking that lemma and moving on. So these are the assumptions that we had from our theorem, and I want to say how we're going to get this associative bilinear map. So fortunately, three already does a lot of work for us. Three tells us that if we've got two elements inside of X, then there is some uh, other element, we'll call it X bullet Y, inside of X such that XY is equal to E times this other element inside of X. That proposition that I just had up takes the other three of these criteria and tells us that this is actually going to be well-defined. So X bullet Y will actually be the unique such element. Um, and why is that? This is this cancellation coming into play. So if there was another element Z such that X times Y is equal to E times Z, then that means E times Z is the same thing as E times X bullet Y which by cancellation means that Z is equal to X bullet Y. Um, so this will actually tell us that this map is going to be well-defined um, and some slightly more um, sophisticated arguing will tell us that this actually gives us this associative bilinear map and it satisfies um, this uh, desired equation that we had before. Okay. So now how to get this C star norm. So we have the associated bilinear map. Now to get the C star norm, first we're going to pretend that E was actually invertible. So if E were invertible, then we could just define the pre C star norm as follows. This bullet norm on any X and X would just simply be the norm inside of B of the inverse of E times X. And that I claim is going to work. Uh, and here's why. So if I take X, um, so I'm not actually proving that it's a, uh, a Banach algebra norm, I'm just checking the C star identity, but bear with me. Um, so if I take um, the bullet norm of X star bullet X, uh, so by definition, that's just E inverse times this guy. Using the invertibility of E, we stick in an extra factor of E inverse times E. Now, remember we had this uh, nice equality um, that was satisfied by this bullet or by this associative bilinear map, in particular E times X star bullet X, that's just X star X. And now from here, we just use the fact that um, E inverse is positive and commutes with everybody. We shuffle things around, use the C star identity inside of B, and there we go. So in general, of course, E is not going to be invertible, but it will have an approximate inverse in B. Uh, and that's just simply going to be, we're just going to take an appropriate sequence of positive functions um, and apply these to E. So these are going to be an approximate inverse inside of B, not inside of X, but inside of B. But that's fine. I can still use B as much as I want. Um, our pre C star norm is just going to be given by taking this limit. Uh, so I claim that this is well defined, that this gives us a norm, it gives us a C star norm, Banach algebra norm, so forth. Um, either way, we're just going to, whoops, come back. We're just going to uh, stick a little square at the bottom of that. Okay. So, saying that we're done with the theorem, what is the C star algebra X bullet? So remember, we, we denote the closure, the C star algebra that we get from closing off um, X with this new multiplication um, by X bullet. So in the nice case where X is actually already closed with respect to this norm, so taking this closure doesn't add anything new to X, then basically X is a C star algebra if you just sort of change the way you look at the elements. And in fact, that means that it can be identified with its enveloping C star algebra or the uh, minimal uh, C star algebra associated to this abstract operator system. Um, 
I want to drive this home yet one more time, that uh, we're not calling X a subsystem of B. If it were, if E were the identity of B, then all of this would be trivial. X would already be a star subalgebra of B. Those four criteria that I put on it would already force it to be an algebra. And X bullet would just be the closure of X inside of B. So it wouldn't be so exciting. Um, one particularly nice example is the example we started with when X arose as the inductive limit of a sufficiently nice CP approximation of a separable unidual nuclear C star algebra. And in that case, that C star algebra is actually going to be isomorphic to this X bullet. So we can completely recover that C star algebra that we started with. Okay. So, because these four criteria take up roughly one third of a slide, uh, if I have a self adjoint subspace of uh, C star algebra that satisfies those criteria that let us turn it into a C star algebra, so I'm just going to call those four criteria together C star, um, because I think we can black box it at this point. Okay. So, our motivation for, for getting um, these four criteria that gave us the C star structure was the image of a CPC order zero map. And now we want to come back full circle. So if I uh, have this self-adjoint subspace of some C star algebra B with this distinguished positive element so that X and E satisfy these four C star criteria, then so I just take the identity map on X, where I take X as sitting as a dense subspace inside of the X bullet C star algebra. And then I identify it with itself sitting as a self-adjoint subspace of B. This will actually extend to a CPC order zero map from this C star algebra into B. And moreover, when the closure, when closing X with respect to this bullet norm, in other words, when X is equal to X bullet as sets, this extension does absolutely nothing. And um, that means exactly that X inside of B is the image of the CPC order zero map. And we get a converse to this as well. So going back in the other direction, if you started with a CPC order zero map um, from a unital C star algebra C into B, the image of C and the image of its unit are going to satisfy these C star criteria. That's actually how we started off with them. But moreover, beta of C is already going to be closed in this induced bullet norm. Uh, so why is theta of C going to be closed in this induced bullet norm? Um, so that's simply just going to be uh, if we compose the map the CPC order zero map from C into B with the identity map that maps theta of C into theta of C bullet, then ignoring the theta of C in the middle, we have a star homomorphism between C star algebras with dense image. And so um, that means that theta of C is going to be closed. So that means that theta of C is equal to its closure under this bullet norm. Uh, and yeah, that was the moreover bit. Okay. Let's write this all together. So the following are equivalent for a self-adjoint subspace of a C star algebra with distinguished element E and X. Um, it was actually the image of a CPC order zero map. And two, the pairs satisfy the criteria C star and X is already complete with respect to this induced bullet norm. Okay, so part three. Let us first recall our motivating example. So our motivating example was a CPC order zero map that had one more nice, particularly nice property, and that was that its image was closed. Now this sort of thing is easy for a star homomorphism to satisfy, but in general, telling when the image of a CPC map is closed, um, even when it's uh, order zero is, is very difficult to do. So to that end, I want to consider the following. Uh, actually, this is all just an excuse to consider the following because I think these uniform order units are neat. Um, so recall that um, 
we defined an order unit as follows. If I have an order unit for a self-adjoint subspace, as follows, if I have a self-adjoint element x in x, then there's some positive number such that if I scale up e by this positive number, it's going to dominate x. The paradigm example for this is the uni in a unital C star algebra. And in fact, we get a slightly stronger criteria, or at least on, on face value, it's a slightly stronger criteria because it seems like we even have like a continuous dependence on A. And with that, I want to define uh, what it means to be a uniform order unit um, for a self-adjoint subspace at a C star algebra. And so that is when there exists a positive uh, number R such that X is less than or equal to r times the norm of x times e for every self-adjoint element x and x. Uh, so this is more of a continuous dependence on x, and hence why it's called a uniform order unit. Um, quick caveat, uh, this is really particularly interesting to me in my setting. Um, this, the idea of a uniform order unit doesn't translate so well um, when you want to consider the norm that's induced by the order structure from E in as much as you're considering an abstract operator system, uh, in which case, once you've imposed a norm on X that comes from the order structure, uh, then you're sort of secretly already thinking of the unit as, as a genuine multiplicative unit, uh, and, and this ends up sort of being trivialized. So this is really mostly interesting for me. This is the norm of X inside of B. Um, but one thing that I want to remark uh, is that this is um, this condition is actually verifiable on just a dense self-adjoint subspace, subspace of X, and that will come into play in like the very last slide, I think. But okay, so what's an example of a uniform order unit? So if M is an operator subsystem of a unital C star algebra, then the unit is a uniform order unit. Um, if you've got a positive element, then it's going to be a uniform order unit in the subspace um, that it span, spans, it spans, it spans, you know, the subspace it generates. Uh, a more interesting example is if we consider this sign, which came from our completely positive approximation of a nuclear C star algebra from before. Uh, this guy is going to be a uniform order unit for the image of uh, A under um, the CPC order zero map sign. And per perhaps a um, illuminating example is a non-example. Uh, so for a non-example, we'll define the following uh, injective CPC order zero map from the continuous functions on the closed interval zero one to the ones that vanish at zero by just multiplying everybody by the identity function. So the one that sends T to T. Then this will be injective CPC order zero map. Uh, as such, it will have an order unit, but this won't be a uniform order unit. Um, so specifically, that means that there's just no single scaling value uh, that I can use to realize the uniformity of the order unit. Um, but I don't want to dwell on that too much. Move to theorem. Right. So, right. So let X be a self adjoint subspace of a C star algebra with E and X such that X and E satisfy the C star criteria. Uh, then it turns out X is already closed in the B norm, if and only if X is closed in the inherited bullet norm, and E is a uniform order unit. Uh, recall that part of this was automatic when X was already the image of a CPC order zero map. Um, in particular, um, C star or that X and the image of the unit satisfy the C star criteria was automatic and moreover, um, the uh, theta of C was already closed in this induced norm. So that means that in this setting, if we have a CPC order zero map from a unital C star algebra, then its image is closed if and only if 
the image of the unit is a uniform order unit. And putting that all together, we get uh, a closure version of the corollary that we had before. So the following are equivalent for a self adjoint subspace of a C star algebra with a distinguished element. And the first is, oh, they both are. So X is closed uh, in the norm it inherits from B, and it is also the image of an injective CPC order zero map. Um, and this is equivalent to saying that the pair X and E satisfy the C star criteria, X is closed in the induced bullet norm, and E is a uniform order unit for X. Okay, epilogue, last little bit. Back to those generalized inductive systems that we started with. So suppose X is uh, again arising as a generalized inductive limit of the, in, of the inductive sequence of uh, finite dimensional C star algebras that arose from a sufficiently nice CP approximation of a separable unital nuclear C star algebra. So not only is X completely order isomorphic to A, which we observed in the, the first bit, but also it's a closed self adjoint subspace of the C star algebra F infinity um, with a matrix order unit so that X and E together satisfy the C star criteria. And what's particularly nice about this is that we can actually pick up on this within the inductive sequence itself. So that means being completely ignorant of A, once this inductive sequence has inherited enough of the nice properties from the CP approximation, it can run on its own. And the inductive limit is going to give me my C star algebra that I wanted. And I can pick up on whether or not the generalized inductive limit is going to satisfy the C star criteria just within the system itself. And where that leads us is definitely the subject of another talk. So I will say thanks for now. Thank you. Do we have any questions or comments, please? So, uh, Christy, from your generalized inductive limit system, somehow can one recover some like KCLE information? Like yes. So I I omitted those those last few slides, but it turns out once you've got a um, so in the in the limit you get the K theory back. Uh, you get the K0 and K1 groups back exactly. Um, so there's a very natural way to define uh, unitaries, there's a very natural way to define projections and the right um, equivalence relations between these and you actually get a nice one-to-one -one correspondence between once you've got a, um, an abstract uh, self-adjoint subspace that satisfies these criteria, then you already have a canonical C star algebra to identify with it and it's going to have the exact same K0 and K1 groups. So we can at least get up to, to identifying all the, um, we can identify the K0 and the K1 groups. Uh, as far as, as pushing this a little bit further, uh, still have to do some of this stuff more concretely in a non-unital setting to to recover you know enough like suspensions and, and bot periodicity but okay thank you so are there other questions or comments okay let's thank our speaker again for a beautiful talk